Hi everybody, my name is Jamie and I'm a solution engineer here at HashiCorp and today I'm going to be talking about how we can secure SSH access to the cloud with HashiCorp Boundary and Vault. Now to start us off, I wanted to share a few data points from a Verizon study that analyzed nearly 80,000 security incidents and data breaches and tried to derive from them what some of the common themes were that were causing these incidents. The first statistic here is what percentage of all of these incidents involved some kind of human actor. Now, unsurprisingly, this is really high. This is 85% of these security incidents involved people. Next is what percentage of these security incidents involved the misuse of credentials? This could either be credentials that have been misplaced or stolen, or even credentials that have been over-provisioned in privilege. This is also really high, this is 61%. Now, I wanna contrast these two data points to the next one, which is what percentage of these security incidents do we think had um, a reliance on some underlying security vulnerability in the software package uh, running our system? This is, contrary to popular belief, actually really low. Um, it's 3%. Now, what I would take away from this investigation report is that actually the biggest risk in your organization is the people. It's, it's not necessarily the technology. And I want you to bear that in mind as we go through this presentation. So to start unpacking this problem, I just wanted to compare side by side what the most common SSH access patterns are that we see in the enterprise today. So the first one we'll all be very familiar with, which is just using an SSH public key. Um, this is a asymmetric key pair where we place the public key on the target host and we authenticate with our private key. The next one I've called centralized IDP. This is, you know, think of LDAP, think of Azure uh, Active Directory. Um, either way, we're offloading the authentication to some sort of central service. And then finally, what I've called traditional privilege access management. This is where we don't control the authentication directly from the user to the end host. The user authenticates to some kind of central platform, and then it's that platform's responsibility to then authenticate down to the host, and it places its controls in there. Now, I want us to compare these three solutions against these three uh, primitives. The first one is how simple are these solutions to operate for the operations teams responsible for them? Um, the next one is what level of security controls can we place around this authentication workflow? And then finally, how easy is it for our developers and our engineers to adopt these patterns? So with an SSH public key pattern, this is, you know, I think we can all think back to when we learned Linux for the first time, the chances are the way that you authenticated to your VM was with a public key. And the reason for that is it's unbelievably simple to set up and get started. Unfortunately, the trade-off of that simplicity is that there are very few controls that you can place around this type of pattern. And because of that, it's actually really easy to adopt. You know, another way to look at adoption would be how much does it disrupt the existing workflow and that would be, um, you know, it doesn't disrupt it much at all. It's, it's really easy to pick up and adopt. The next one with uh, centralized IDP. Yep, it's a little less simple to operate. You've got a central service that you've got to manage. You've got to point all your hosts towards the central service. But in uh, exchange for that, we do get more control. We can start enforcing policies with our users. We get centralized auditing and logging. And how easy is this for an organization to adopt? Yeah, a, a little bit less easy than something like SSH public key, um, but still relatively simple solution. And um, now going over to our traditional privilege access management platform. These are, at least from what my customers tell me, pretty um, complex systems to operate and roll out and they involve a lot of components. And the trade-off for all of that is that they give us a ton of control. 
we can really be very prescriptive about how and when and why somebody is able to connect to a target host. And unfortunately, that means getting users to adopt these platforms can actually be quite difficult. These platforms are usually very disruptive to an engineer's workflow. So let's go through each one of these in a little more detail. And I want to talk about where each of these workflows could potentially be improved. Starting with the SSH public key pattern, I'm going to go through this workflow with my two personas over here on the left. The sysadmin you can think of is the person responsible for administering and setting up this workflow to begin with. And then my developer is going to be the consumer of this workflow. Every scenario that I step through, we're all going to be SSHing into the same Linux server. So the first thing that my sysadmin is going to have to do is securely create a asymmetric key pair. The two assets that are going to be created is a public key, which he's going to use some form of configuration management to push out to the Linux server. And then we have the private key, which he's got to come up with some mechanism to securely transport that to my developer. And at that point, my developer can SSH in his terminal directly to my Linux server. Now, this as simple as a workflow as it is, comes with some trade-offs. And we saw that in the previous slide. And that is, there's very little controls we can place around a workflow like this. For example, this uh, private key here in red, really once that's left my sysadmin and went to the developer, we have no way as an organization to control who's going to consume that key. So if the developer then leaves it on a Bastion host or moves it to his personal laptop, we've got no way to know that that has happened. The next thing is my developer has persistent network access. So even if we did have some way to invalidate that key, which we could do, there's nothing stopping my developer just continually attempting to access my Linux server. He has network reachability between his laptop and the Linux server. And these two combined are two obvious areas that we might look at to improve in an upcoming workflow. The next one I'd like to step through is the centralized IDP. Now here I've got my same two personas over here on the left, my Linux server over here on the right. There's a little bit more setup required because we are now managing a central service. And my sysadmin has got to create something common like a SS, uh, triple SD configuration file and push that out to the Linux server. If you're not familiar with triple SD, all that does is tell the Linux server to trust my central IDP for authentication purposes. The next thing my sysadmin has got to do is he's now going to create my developer a user in the IDP. And now my developer can go to his same terminal and SSH into the Linux server. And when he does that, the Linux server is going to reach out to the IDP, potentially perform some MFA, but commonly not, and then allow the user to log in. Now, the obvious places where this workflow could be improved would be, although we have some controls over this password, i.e. forcing complexity or forcing a rotation policy, it's still a static credential. And if that password is shared, it wouldn't stop somebody else potentially using that password. And then just as the previous workflow, we have, oh, we have persistent network access available from the developer's laptop to the Linux server. This means even if we were to disable this developer's account, there's nothing stopping him using another account, account that he potentially had the credentials for. Next, let's have a look at the traditional PAM. And the architecture starts to get a little bit more complex here. Again, I've still got my same two personas over here on the left and my Linux server over here on the right. And now we're going to start managing what we call common accounts, some well-known usernames and um, potentially a root or administrator account. And we're going to bring them under the management of our PAM solution. We're still going to have our IDP deployed in place. And the role of our sysadmin to configure all of this is first, he's going to have to go through some onboarding process where a new server gets deployed. Maybe the team that deployed that server raises a ticket to have that server onboarded into the PAM solution. And then our sysadmin will go 
usually through a manual um, GUI-driven workflow to register that server into the PAM appliance. Next, my sysadmin has got to be aware of these user accounts. He's got to make sure that they're created correctly, and he's got to go through a process of importing them into the PAM for the PAM to manage. And then finally, we had still have a configuration management element on that Linux server. For a developer, the workflow will look like this. The developer now no longer authenticates directly to our Linux server, but to a central service. That service will definitely reach out to an IDP, which will enforce some sort of multi-factor authentication. And once the PAM solution is uh, confident about the developer is who he says he is, he will then allow the developer to a process that is usually called checking out an account. So choosing one of these common accounts to use, and maybe there's even further approval gates before this is allowed to take place. And then is the PAM's responsibility to authenticate with that account to the Linux server and allow the developer to use that pathway onto the Linux server commonly by using something like an SU at the very end so the Linux server still sees uh, the particular developer's account. Now this is um, pretty common in an enterprise environment. This is exactly how we've traditionally done privilege access management. And from a maybe more modern lens, there's a few areas that we would potentially like to improve upon this workflow. The first one is that onboarding process. The customers that I've spoken to around privilege access management all talk about a very painful and slow process of onboarding workloads into the PAM. Into, uh, sorry, contrasting to a traditional data center where workloads were deployed pretty statically or maybe not that often at all, um, maybe that wasn't as much of a problem, but in a new cloud environment where we deploy code really regularly, um, that can be a bottleneck. The next thing, my sysadmin has got to manage these privileged accounts. They're gonna import them into the privilege access management tool and um, that process still has some operational overhead. And then finally, we still have static credentials. Even though the PAM can put some good controls around who and when can access these accounts, there's still static credentials that exist within our environment. Now, coming out of the traditional PAM, I want to share how we believe HashiCorp boundary is different. So I'm gonna go through um, my two personas over in the left again with my Linux server. Apart from this time, I've got HashiCorp boundary deployed in the middle. And where we previously had them well-known static credentials, we have nothing. And we're gonna take a look at what our sysadmin would have to do to operationalize a system like this. So the first thing our sysadmin is gonna not have to do is manually add our hosts into Boundary. Boundary was built for the cloud and understands the cloud APIs natively. So when you deploy your instance into AWS or Azure, Boundary is gonna recognize that you've deployed an instance. It's gonna apply policy via tagging and then instances are gonna automatically be imported into Boundary. The next thing is that this solution is not gonna depend on any static credentials. Everything that we're gonna to use to authenticate to the server is gonna be generated on demand. And then of course, we've still got a little bit of configuration management that we have to do at the end. So from a developer perspective, my developer is going to authenticate into Boundary and Boundary is going to rely on an IDP to provide some sort of multi-factor authentication. And then the developer is gonna be allowed to access our Linux server. Now this is where Boundary is gonna reach out to HashiCorp Vault and ask Vault to generate a credential on our behalf. In this example, Vault is gonna be creating a SSH certificate that is time limited and tightly scoped as to what it can do. That certificate is gonna be pushed into the developer's workflow and we're gonna use that certificate to authenticate into the Linux server. Now I've went through that pretty quickly. We're gonna go through it practically now in a demo. So if I was to pull up my terminal, the very first thing I'm gonna do as a developer is I'm gonna to authenticate to Boundary. Now here we would do that by running authenticate. And today I'm just gonna use a username and password. 
Um, I'm going to authenticate quickly here. And Boundary is going to come back and issue me a Boundary token. This just means I've been successfully authenticated to Boundary. At this stage, I can now ask Boundary to tell me what targets I have access to. So I'd run this command, boundary targets list, and it's going to tell me I have two targets to choose from. Here I have a production cluster, because boundary can also work with Kubernetes workflows. And we have a Linux server, which is what we're going to be looking at today. So if I was to now run my boundary connect over SSH, I'm going to pass uh, the target name, which was Linux 1001. When I press this, the workflow that we've just seen is going to be happening behind the scenes. So Boundary is going to ask Vault to generate a short-lived SSH certificate. And we're going to use that certificate to connect to the Linux VM. You can see here my prompt is now changed. I'm on my Linux host. And just for the sake of the demo, we're going to run some commands. Um, let's take a look at um, some open sockets. Um, what else can we do? Uh, let's bring up a TUI, see what's running on the box. And then at some point, we're going to exit the server. Now I've finished my session, what I want to show you is what it might look like from that sysadmin's perspective. So here I'm going to sign into Boundary as an administrator. Once we log into Boundary, we're going to take a look at what controls we have around that SSH session. The first place I want to show you is the SSH session recording. So here we can see the session that just took place. It happened with my Linux server, and it lasted about 40 seconds. And now we're able to view the session and play it back. So all SSH channels are recorded and stored in our S3 bucket. And if we were to play the session back, we would see in real time exactly the commands that I pressed as I pressed them. So just in a second, you'll see it starts to play out the first command that I wrote, which was the hostname command, and then some IP and some socket commands. And then finally, I ran top. There we go. So here from a system ad administrator's perspective, even though my developer was able to use their native tools directly in their terminal, we still have a good level of control around what was happening within that session. So let's go back to the slides for a second. So let's take a look at why that workflow was so much more secure. Well, if you remember when I ran that SSH command, I didn't actually provide a credential we leveraged Boundary and HashiCorp Vault's integration to dynamically generate that SSH certificate on demand. This concept we call inside a Boundary credential injection. And this is how it looks like. So I've got my developer over here on the left and the same Linux server on the right. And my architecture actually has Boundary controller deployed at the top, my Boundary worker, which you can think of as the data plan, and then HashiCorp Vault sort of behind the scenes. My developer will authenticate to the boundary controller, which you saw me run the boundary authenticate command, and then connect through the boundary worker. On demand, HashiCorp Vault will vend an SSH certificate with a short TTL, pass it to the worker, and the worker will transparently merge it into that SSH connection on its way to the Linux server. And what this means is that that SSH key never leaves the confines of my environment. So even if my developer did want to try and access that Linux server, otherwise it couldn't. Not only is the persistent network access not there because the boundary worker wouldn't accept the connection, but also because the SSH certificate that's required to log into the Linux server wouldn't have been created so unless Boundary asked it to be. If we zoom in to this Linux server and have a look at what happened in the logs when that authentication took place, you'll see that the authentication from the SSH certificate came from Vault. 
including the SSH certificate serial number, so we have auditability, and both of them combined allowed me to open a TTL and SSH session into this Linux server. So to summarize everything, let's put this new type of workflow side by side the three other workflows from the beginning of this presentation. So Boundary, when it comes to operational simplicity, we believe because we can do this dynamic host catalog generation, meaning we don't have to go through these static processes of onboarding workloads into Boundary, it becomes much more simple to operate. We saw in the demonstration that the sysadmin is able to log into the Boundary server and watch the entire session take place even though that session took place in my own terminal and I was using native tools. And then finally, because I'm able to use the tools that I prefer to use, which is my own terminal, that means the adoption of this type of tool inside of an enterprise environment is always gonna be less restrictive. So if you found any of these workflows that we spoke about today, or wanna explore some more workflows, including generating Kubernetes service accounts on demand for a kubectl command, or even logging into a database with a dynamically generated da database username and password, please reach out. We would love to keep the conversation going. But that is everything I've got here to share today, and thank you.